why we've got the legislation and how it then fits into the overall um, aim to uh, reduce the uptake of smoking and helping smokers to quit. Uh, smoking still the leading cause of preventable death in the UK and we're talking about approximately 100,000 deaths uh, caused by this particular product. So try and compare that with any other product that we within Trading Standards, Environmental Health or other regulators are, are, are trying to deal with. Now the legislation I think when we go through it and when you read it can look extremely bureaucratic and incredibly finicky I suppose you could say. But all of that has a particular purpose and it's sort of evidence based to as I say, reduce the uptake of smoking, make the products look less attractive and that's entirely deliberate and help smokers to quit by uh, emphasizing the, uh, the health messages and making them much more prominent. And I think that's one of the things that we as regulators need to do when we get to say the court stage to, before magistrates or judges to make sure that people realize this is not just bureaucracy, the things that I'm going to go through, but is actually for a purpose and then links into the other uh, tobacco control legislation so underage sales, point of sale display and smoke free legislation for example. So although I'm going to be talking mainly about the two new pieces of legislation uh, we do have to bear in mind the other uh, tools that we've got in this area and the other <clears throat> pieces of legislation. So the two pieces of legislation, Tobacco and Related Products Directive, um, come into f almost full force on the 20th of May 2017. And if you've got access to the, uh, the slides um, on your screens, you should see the, the two titles and the, the hyperlinks to the legislation themselves. If you right click on the uh, the numbers you should be able to access the legislation. So the two pieces of legislation I think really need to be read together to be as one. <clears throat> Tobacco and related products regulations introduces the provisions of the EU Tobacco Products Directive into UK law and the standardized packaging of tobacco products regs takes that a stage further, much further than um, a lot of uh, EU countries and really keeps the UK at the head of this really important uh, work uh, in relation to improving uh, uh, our relationship I suppose you would say with, with uh, tobacco products. So the new things within um, and I'll, I'll keep saying both pieces of legislation but really within the tobacco and related products regs the new things are control of uh, electronic cigarettes sometimes referred to as uh, nicotine inhaling products remember they're not uh, tobacco products they're a separate uh, category and the main things within within this reg regulation is, is firstly an ad ban so a big change in advertising ban, um, requirement for particular container sizes, restrictions on the use of additives in the particular products, uh, requirement for health warnings and instructions and a ban on anything that implies that the product itself is, uh, is healthier, has health claims or contains uh, within it something that gives you a health benefit. Um, it's worth remembering though that in relation to nicotine inhaling products, e-cigarettes, there is still the requirements of the general product safety regulations and low voltage uh, electrical equipment regulations, particularly in relation to safety, which appears to me to be the um, safety of the charges, which appears to me to be the current problem with these products. So the safety of the charges is is probably more of an immediate problem than the product itself although these regulations do introduce a comprehensive range of uh, requirements uh, that 
regulates the product pretty much in the same way that every other product is regulated. It doesn't go beyond that apart from, I suppose, in the advertising ban. Um, also remember that there is a, a separate requirement for uh, medical devices that fall within the category of uh, e-cigarettes that are also medical devices. Really that's all I wanted to say about that particular product but it's that is where we would go for any information on uh, electronic cigarettes and concentrate on tobacco products and uh, the other new area which is herbal herbal products. So tobacco products it's the usual definition we're looking at cigarettes hand rolling tobacco and uh, shisha but not uh, cigarette papers when sold separately and what the two pieces of legislation do is really completely revises the look of the packs and that's including hand rolling tobacco packs uh, even the contents of the packs, so cigarettes themselves, the physical cigarette is included in the standardized packaging regulations, so they basically have to be matte white, they can have the imitation cork end and contain the, the brand variant written around uh, the cigarette, not up and down it. Um, and if you've seen any of the new packs, uh, which must be on sale uh, from uh, the 20th of May 2017, nothing else after that date, they look in many ways completely different. And in a moment, we'll look at a, an example. Herbal products are included in the uh, tobacco uh, and related products regs, and that would include shisha that doesn't contain uh, tobacco. Uh, there's a further requirement for um, notification of novel tobacco products. So things that you may have seen recently being advertised, heat not burn products uh, that are starting to come onto the market. Just a few key points. I would have to stress that the, the, uh, the outline in the schedule of what a pack looks like in, in both pieces of legislation, very detailed, including to detail of the cellophane that wraps the pack, the closure that uh, keeps that cellophane together. Really need to look at a pack in one hand and the, the regulations in the other. But again, I'd have to stress, this is not bureaucracy. This is things that uh, have been assessed as working. So just a few headlines, I suppose. Minimum pack size for cigarettes of, of 20. Uh, for hand rolling tobacco, it's 30 grams. Slims aren't actually banned, so slim cigarettes, Vogue, uh, Pearl being the, probably the key brand, but the size requirements of the pack makes it unlikely that it's even worth uh, the producers uh, making them. The pack would actually be enormous and the, the cigarettes would probably have to be lying uh, horizontally or something to, to fit them in. The biggest change within the uh, tobacco and related products regulations, I think, is to the health warning, which is now in three stages. So there's a general warning, uh, an info message, an information message, and that lays down the exact wording that is to be used. And then a combined text and picture warning, and we've got a new series of pictures and cessation messages and a rotation date within the regulations as to when these pictures and, and messages have to be introduced and that's actually set down in, in regulation. It may be, seem in, uh, unusual that what has actually been removed is the maximum emission statement. Uh, this is the carbon uh, monoxide uh, tar nicotine. The limits remain the same as before, but they've been removed because it was felt that um, these were given the implication that some tobacco products were, were, were better for you than others because they had less tar or less nicotine, whatever it happened to be. So that's why they've been removed. Overall, I mustn't suggest the product is less harmful in any way. and. The biggest change, although it's actually quite a small part of the, the market in the UK, is the ban on uh, flavours, except for 
menthol, which has a, a stay of execution until 2020. However, it's uh, interesting to note that the use of the word menthol on the pack or in the name of the product is, is banned. So you can still use menthol um, in the product, but not the word menthol. And you can still sell uh, flavoured cigarette papers if they are sold separately. So the, the paper itself, anything within the, the cigarette, including the filter, can't uh, introduce a, uh, a flavour. So you should now be able to see the standardised pack. And the thing to say is, uh, first of all, this picture was taken from the initial government uh, guidelines and the eventual pack is actually much browner than that it's Pantone 448C which is browner than the sort of the green version that's on the screen there and you can see the um, the, the pictures uh, and the uh, combined warning up the side we have the smoking kills quit now which is the um, the general warning, and on the other side, we have the info me message tobacco smoke contains over 70 substances, and so forth. The UK duty paid mark is still on, and underneath the U UK duty paid mark is uh, an identification, a barcode, which is the still the requirement to have an indication of where the product was produced and when, so that the product can be tracked. The 2002 uh, Tobacco Products Manufacturing Presentation and Sale Regulations have been revoked apart from Regulation 10, which requires that marking to be on, so the, the tracking marking that's required. Under the um, Tobacco Regulations, there is going to be an EU-wide uh, track and trace system that's not been introduced yet and we won't even get the details until the end of the year. Now until that comes into effect, Regulation 10 of the 2002 regulations, the requirement to give an indication of where a product comes from is still in force. For those of you who still use uh, the tobacco scanners, uh, they should still work for the large uh, producers but not for um, for, for uh, every manufacturer and remember uh, these appearance these uh, products uh, requirements also apply to, to roll your own also new as I mentioned is herbal products which would include uh, shisha uh, requirement to um, have a health warning smoking this product damages your health and again mustn't suggest that the product is less harmful and just to remember as well that the use of herbal products, herbal cigarettes or herbal shisha would still breach uh, smoke-free legislation. There are controls on cigars, uh, not as uh, strong as the standardized packaging and as a, a, a special uh, warning there. This tobacco product damages your health and is addictive. Tobacco for oral use, so snooze, is still um, still banned. Now I realize we're pressed for time so I'll move on to the next slide and just very briefly just outline there the um, the powers issue this is where the powers under both sets of legislation have now, uh, now come the order is in force and uh, the powers are now uh, completed uh, just a couple of other things that um, the penalty for the offences is um, three, up to three months or a fine. The, the notion of a level five fine has been reduced. It simply says fine um, and under for in, indictable offences it's two years or a fine. So effectively open-ended fines. Briefly want to mention the alternatives to trademark offences and you may be wondering why on earth you would want to take alternatives and I think from my perspective it's very much to avoid contacting the tobacco industry uh, which gives them an opportunity to improve their corporate image and to compromise our compliance with uh, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and really uh, 
stops us effectively protecting the brand, the brand name of a product that kills one in two of its uh, users. So I've listed a few alternatives there and a lot of these do require when you get to court some context given to the, to the magistrates or to the, uh, to the judge. So labelling offences and the context there is these are not just bureaucracy, they are for a, a purpose. Uh, to stop people taking up cigarettes and to help them um, stop smoking. Reduced ignition propensity test, it's probably the only point, in fact it's definitely the only point where uh, non-compliant cigarettes are more dangerous than those that actually comply. But it's not a fail-safe reduced ignition propensity, but it is something that magistrates can, can understand. Customs and Excise Management Act uh, we can take offences under that if you get consent from the Director of Public Prosecutions via the Crown Prosecution Service. And on the final slide in a moment, there's a link to the, the page where that's uh, uh, shown for duty evasion offences. The Criminal Attempts Act, uh, so the, the criminal attempt is the attempt to evade duty, it's another possibility and using the consumer protection from unfair trading regs which uh, one of the banned practices is uh, creating the impression that a product can legally be sold when it can't want to bear in mind so why those options when there's a, a straightforward trademark uh, offence available and I think one of the drawbacks of using trademark offences is it brings the tobacco industry in and they then have the opportunity to take over the publicity. And I've just picked out three messages that they are very, very keen on using. So references to quality. It just, I can't understand how a product that can kill one in two of its users can be described as, as quality, but there we go. The illicit tobacco contains rat droppings. There is no evidence to suggest this actually has ever happened. All tobacco contains uh, four to five thousand chemicals, uh, tobacco smoke, and all ha all have the potential or the possibility of, of causing you harm. Illicit tobacco is worse for you. Well, as I say, there all tobacco kills one in two of its long-term users. And illicit tobacco is out of control, and this is probably the one that the tobacco industry really try and, uh, and pick up on uh, after the quality issue. Well, there is a long-term decline in the, in the market, and a lot of it has been achieved by um, the work that you've done and we've done over the years uh, in, in uh, partnership with the police and customs and so on. And really what I think that these two pieces of legislation give us, along with the other legislation we've got, is a real chance to make a difference to the regulation of tobacco products and to really make an, an impact on the uh, smoking uptake and uh, helping people to quit. So on the final slide then, I'll, I'll finish now, uh, we have a link to the illicit tobacco uh, partnership and that has a lot of resources uh, including a public relations guide and as I've said before really important to get your PR uh, uh, correct and to make sure that it's your PR and not the tobacco industries and then the link to the director of public uh, prosecutions permissions page uh, which would allow you to um, use the uh, provisions of the uh, Customs and Excise Management Act to take uh, offences for non-duty payment. So that's my, uh, my presentation part. Um, are there any questions? Thanks Richard, uh, that was really informative. We've got um, a few questions here so we'll, we should have time for one or two questions right, and good. then we can, we can come back to some of them maybe later on. So the first one um, is where the tobacco and related product regulation 507 slash 2016 has information regarding health warnings mm -hmm. and the standardized, standardized packaging 823 slash 2015 has different appearance requirements is there a conflict between the two requirements? Without actually lo looking at them 
exactly. I, I would say no. Um, the two do have to be read as one, and I think that that's one of those questions that I would probably it's best if I get back to the to the, the question on that one, uh, if you could send it to me. The, the, they were drafted separately, uh, but the intent uh, by the drafters was that they they are complementary. Um, the requirement for the size of the um, the health warning within the European Tobacco Products Directive, so the tobacco and products regulations, they were minimums and member states could go beyond those sizes. Now I think this is probably a, a situation where the UK has decided to go beyond the minimum requirements of the uh, tobacco products directive. So for example standardized packaging is not included in the tobacco products directive but it is allowed that we could we can as a as a member state uh, go beyond that so it could be one of those situations where we've actually gone beyond the requirement thanks richard that's really really helpful there was a couple of other questions but i think what i'm going to do now is i'm going to um hand over to doug and chris and uh, we've, we've also got a bit more time for question and answers right. after doug and chris's presentation. So first of all we're going to go to Doug Love and Doug works for the Trading Standards in the London Borough of Islington um, and he is going to give us an overview of Operation Shona and explain how the resources can best be utilised in an area without a regional partnership. Doug. Thank you. Good morning everybody. Uh, yes, I'm going to speak uh, very briefly about the, how the North and East London Illegal Tobacco Group works and how its recent operation, Operation Shona, uh, hopefully made the best use of some fairly score, uh, scarce resources. Uh, the group was formed a couple of years ago um, following the excellent lead of the South East London Group. Uh, to make better use of scarce resources uh, from public health and trading standards budgets and also to encourage um, our councils to devote and continue devoting resources to illegal tobacco. Uh, currently we have eight boroughs as members which are Camden, Enfield, Hackney, Haringey, Islington, Newham, Tower Hamlets and Waltham Forest. Uh, but we don't have any set budget. Um, all the group's work is dependent on the uh, desire to be involved and to contribute funding on a piecemeal basis. Um, I think there is a, a realisation in the group that we won't necessarily get increased funding in the current financial situation, but we wanted to give our local authorities a better reason not to reduce funding that they do have. Um, there's now three London groups as well as us in the South East one. Uh, there's a group similar group in northwest London and I think we're aiming to work more closely with the other London groupings and our forthcoming project for 2007 um, is planning to have a sustained period of road shows across the capital in July 2017 um, and I think hopefully that we'll eventually move towards as much pan London uh, coordination as is achievable it is, however, somewhat of a sticking plaster solution. Um, the, what is needed in London is not independent groups and boroughs trying to make the best of a bad job. What we really need is a genuine pan-London approach with proper funding. So, um, Operation Shona, that was the first enforcement project undertaken by the group and six of the eight boroughs participated. Uh, the purpose was to detect illegal tobacco in retail premises and um, we tried to design the project to make the most of the, the scarce resources available. The ways we did this was by undertaking uh, cheap tobacco test purchases uh, where we sent in purchases a few days before the enforcement visits which um, was reasonably successful. I think uh, about one in seven resulted in a sale, but even where there was no sale, we sometimes got additional intelligence. 
um, the, the biggest seizure in Islington was as, was as a result of one business saying we don't but they do down the road. Uh, other seizures came from no sale but suspicious behaviour of the employee serving. We used uh, multiple teams in a single borough um, and by having officers working in each other's boroughs and that allowed us typically to have three mixed uh, HMRC and local authority teams and a local coordinator who travelled with the single dog team that we had. Uh, this enabled more visits and also um, simultaneous hits where target businesses were in sight of each other or had linked ownership or something like that. Uh, the detection dogs and their handler uh, moved between the three enforcement teams and this meant that dogs weren't hanging around waiting for officers to complete a seizure. As soon as the tobacco was detected they could move on to help another team. And sometimes the dogs weren't needed at all. Um, if the test purchasers had been able to identify where the tobacco was and or officers had found it before the dogs arrived, uh, then obviously the dogs would be sent elsewhere. Finally, we, we tried to do um, out of hours seizures, uh, mostly working on a Friday evening and then during the day on a Saturday uh, in an attempt to catch those offenders who, anecdotally at least, um, are said to only have illegal stock in the premises when they think enforcement officers won't be around. Um, the results um, for a fairly low cost projects I think are, are quite successful in enforcement terms. Uh, we managed uh, 139 test purchases and as I say I think about one in seven of those resulted in a sale. And 89 visits over the five days we had the dogs, uh, that's across the six London boroughs. We found 44 retailers who were selling illicit tobacco. Uh, the vast majority of those were um, resulted in seizures, although there were one or two who sold on the test purchase, but then we couldn't find anything in the, in the shop. So I don't know if that's chance or if it is so well hidden that even the dogs couldn't find it, we're not sure, but m most of them were, did result in seizures. And altogether, over those few days, um, we seized a lot of cigarettes, tobacco, um, alcohol as well we looked at uh, because we had HMRC with us and because it still reflects on the business, although we didn't try not to spend too much time looking for alcohol. The, the primary um, purpose of the project was to look for illicit tobacco. Um, having said that, you don't shut your eyes, so we also uh, seized uh, various times legal medicines, counterfeit headphones, counterfeit batteries and, and other things. But on the cigarettes, tobacco and alcohol, um, the total duty in VAT that was payable and therefore was being evaded was about £30,000, uh, which even if you disregard uh, any savings on duty evasion caused by changing the business's behaviour, just on the day is far more than the cost of the, the project. The unfortunate thing of course being that's a saving to the Treasury ultimately uh, when it's the local authorities who are paying for it, they don't get any immediate benefit. We found uh, several benefits in working this way, uh, obviously the opportunity to work with colleagues from HMRC and other authorities is, helps to disseminate best practice. Um, I think we achieved far more visits than if we just had uh, one team in one borough each day. There was no um, impingement on how each local authority would handle the offenders. Um, Authorities in the group are probably at different stages of uh, this sort of work, so some take a much harder line than others are able to. 
it enabled HMRC to partake. Certainly in London, they uh, are discouraged from doing too many retail visits. And typically, if one council phones them up and says, could uh, we work with HMRC officers for a day, they'll probably get a no at the moment. But because we could go to them and say, we've got this project planned on these days, and it covers a large part of North London, they were able to partake. And also, they benefited from the local intelligence that we had. So the visits weren't as uh, random as maybe HMRC retail visits can be. The uh, use of the dogs and the handler, I think, was quite efficient and it wasn't perfect, but um, it, I say at least there was no occasion where they were hanging around just waiting for officers to finish uh, bagging and tagging evidence. And it's also the, the concentrated effort to do it made it at least theoretically easier to publicise. Um, I don't think we did unfortunately get very much uh, coverage, although we, we tried. But in theory, it should be easier to publicise. There are a few things that could have worked better. Um, I think after the first weekend we did, we decided we hadn't probably planned the route very well. Uh, but we also got unlucky with a wet Friday evening, which sends the traffic uh, or makes the traffic exponentially worse in London. Maybe some of the test purchasing we were able to do um, wasn't as refined as it could be. Uh, ideally, you'd have test purchasers that matched the ethnicity of the business and were practiced in doing test purchases. But of course, that would have been another cost where we tended to get by by using volunteers from the um, special constables in the police or from other local authority staff. Uh, communications could have been better, as I say, maybe we were slightly un underprepared. We did get lucky in that we were filmed by ITN News, so there was clips of one of the uh, visits on there. But even they concentrated uh, largely on the financial aspects, uh, whereas when I was interviewed, I was trying to concentrate on the health messages and put it into context for people. But uh, unfortunately, that got cut. Obviously, the best way we could have got linked to the health messages into the um, enforcement work and made it all one is if we had been working in an environment of concerted uh, efforts to raise awareness and reduce consumer demand. Unfortunately, in London, that doesn't really happen at the moment. Had it had it uh, been present, there's, uh, there would have probably been more media pick up and the health messages may have acted as a spur for the public to report illegal tobacco. Unfortunately, because of our restrictions on funding, we, there's no one even who can produce a proper report on the, the uh, project. We have a results sheet which will go onto the Knowledge Hub at some stage in, in a obviously redacted form, but there's not not the ability to do what we would have liked to do, I think, which is to produce a proper report. And uh, I think that's the all I've had to say on it. Thanks, Chris. Um, that was excellent. And I'm going to hand, uh, sorry, thanks, Doug. <laughs> I'm looking at the next name on the agenda. And um, I'm going to hand over to Chris uh, in a second. And just a reminder before I do so that um, feel free to continue asking questions um, for any of the speakers as uh, the presentations are taking place. <laughs> so next we're going to hear from Chris Cooper. Uh, Chris works for Stra Trading Standards at Durham County Council and he's going to give us an overview of the activities of Durham Trading Standards team and how they prioritise activities in the context of a regional partnership. Chris. Um, apologies to those listening. We are just working on a couple of technical difficulties. 
Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Chris, yes. Right, are we Chris, okay to go? Yes, we are. Chris, thank you very much. I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can all see my slides. Um, I would just like to start by giving a bit of background to the enforcement of illicit tobacco in County Durham because it will give you a picture of why we've approached things the way we have. Um, County Durham is a rural county just south of Newcastle and is characterised by a patchwork of small towns and villages around the city of Durham which is at the centre. It has areas of social and pockets of social and economic deprivation uh, with a relatively high smoking prevalence. As such, uh, cheap tobacco is, is something that is, uh, if you like, always on offer in these, in these uh, areas. And uh, we have a particular problem with tab houses uh, where there's sales of illicit tobacco from private premises. So the approach in Durham is very much a product of joint working with public health to achieve their vision of reducing smoking prevalence to 5% by 2030. The control of illicit tobacco is seen as a key strand in achieving this target as the supply of illicit tobacco undermines the work of the stop smoking services and is often an easy source of cigarettes for children and other people to start smoking. So what are the key issues for Durham? Okay. Uh, protection of children is high on our list. Many of the tab houses in County Durham uh, openly sell cigarettes to children. We have witnessed kids in school uniform dropping in to buy their cigarettes on the way to school. Uh, and, and these sellers have no qualms at all uh, about selling to kids at any time of the day. Clearly this is unacceptable. Uh, and also we have the, the, the fair marketplace issue with bona fide tobacco retailers being disadvantaged by the unregulated supply. Um, and perhaps the biggest issue for us and our partners is the evidence that illicit tobacco has clear links with organized crime within County Durham as it's seen as a relatively low risk enterprise when compared with drug dealing and as a clear opportunities for money laundering. But the main driver continues to be the links with tackling poor health and deprivation within County Durham. And we are very fortunate in having secured public health funding for officers to tackle, tackle this problem. So resources, what resources have we put towards this uh, illicit tobacco? We are fortunate being a county that we do have quite a, a large officer a resource to start with. Um, and so we're fortunate in that respect, but the funding from public health has enabled us to have a dedicated tobacco control team. Uh, it consists of three part-time consumer protection officers all of whom at the moment are ex-police and they come with proven skills of intelligence gathering, surveillance and experience of complex investigations. So they've been able to hit the ground running as soon as the funding was available. We have also trained up from within the team uh, a part-time financial investigator. This is because we believe the hardest way of hitting these people is to hit them in the pocket and proceeds of crime is, and, and cash seizures is proving to be very, very useful uh, as a deterrent for these people. Uh, as I say, we have a fairly large amount of uh, officers uh, being a county, so there is backup from other members of the service. What we've done as well as we've made sure that we've equipped our officers with the very latest surveillance equipment, uh, and I'll go on to talk about how we approach uh, operations using this equipment. Uh, and also we have a very much a training commitment. Uh, we've trained almost all our officers now in mobile and foot surveillance oh, and complex invest investigations. So I'll go on the next slide. The basis of our approach is, is, is certainly based around intelligence gathering uh, from multiple sources. A lot of our ex-police officers have been involved in intelligence gathering um, in their previous experience and the, uh, we've put this to good use. We, we've adopted the national intelligence model to, to record this and, and adopted a problem-solving approach to tackling the, the illicit tobacco problem. As far as intelligence goes, I mean, we would say it's not just the police that we're intelligence systems that we'll interrogate. We, we will have, we, we do talks to people. Uh, we have lots of campaigns and briefings. We've used the tobacco road show. So our intelligence, uh, sources are greatly developed and I think I must my first advice to anybody 
who wants to really tackle this problem, you have to get your intelligence sorted uh, because that gives you the, if you, if you like, the basis to develop and tackle these people properly. We have an exceptionally high profile in the media. Every move we make, uh, every warrant executed, every court appearance is, is uh, we have a press release and we have a great, uh, if you like, uh, we have a good relationship with the press so that they, they publicize everything we do. Um, as I say, campaigns of briefing are essential. Uh, we talk to housing, um, police officers, community groups, anybody we can to get the message out there. And uh, it's, it's a means of, as I say, developing intelligence so that we know where this product's being sold and who it's being sold by. So as I say, key to this is highly effective partnership working certainly with the police. The police have been fantastic. Uh, we have, we're lucky in that we have a police alcohol harm reduction unit based within trading standards uh, and the officers within this team help us with this uh, work as well. So you know, that, that is, is, is very important especially when you're tackling sort of more serious um, offenders. Uh, you've got to have the backing of the police to carry out this work. So intelligence, and again, it's, we've tried to sort of grade intelligence into three areas, three, three tiers with increasing sort of quality and verification. Um, so we start with tier one, which is often the low level, um, anonymous, uh, with little corroboration. Uh, sometimes we can't do much with this at all. Um, it, it's just not enough, but we, 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 we log it anyway. Um, second tier is limited but capable of development. development. It may have some surveillance difficulties. For example, um, it may not be easy to, to do a test purchase. It may not be something that is overt, if you like, as far as um, selling, going, selling, selling opportunities or test purchase opportunities. So again, it may take more work. So we try and concentrate mainly on the tier three, which is good quality, verifiable and can be developed with a full directed surveillance um, to a full scale operation. In this case, as often there's evidence of large scale operation and links to organized crime. I mean, to give you an example of the sort of thing we're dealing with, uh, at the top level, we will have tab houses which are selling to 100 to 150 people a day. Uh, and then that's right at the top level, but we have everything from the small, if you like, small um, supplier to friends and family right up to this scale. So what are our tactics? Um, well, as I say, we adopt a problem-solving approach to each, uh, each piece of intelligence, and we keep varying the tactics because we don't want people to get used to the way uh, we do things. We're making increasing use of door knocks for tier one intelligence so that we, we put a warning out to people, try and, if you like, um, let them know they're on the radar and this has been very effective and we've had people saying right that's it we're giving up when we didn't realize you know you were on to us and all this and, and that approach does seem to have worked very well uh, with our financial investigator we can now do lots of background checks for potential targets to see whether uh, the scale of the operation sometimes these checks will reveal that they're uh, trading on a bigger scale than we first realized and this all adds to the intelligence profile. Uh, surveillance is used sparingly. There's a, there's a, there's a responsibility in using surveillance and doing so properly. Uh, and that's why I've invested a lot in training. And it will be a tool, but not the only tool that we'll use. Obviously, I can't go into too much detail, but if people like to contact me separately, um, I'm quite happy to um, talk more openly about the sort of tactics that we use. Uh, we make much use of tobacco and cash dogs. Cash dogs are often supplied by the police, but again, these are these are very useful uh, tools, especially when a lot of the stuff is now hidden, um, not only for retail premises, but in, in um, private houses, we do have things stashed away which are not obvious to, to search officers. So going on to how we tackle this, tackle, um, sort of tab houses we do have to prove that they're not for personal use so test purchasing is quite crucial in this uh, it's the best evidence for proving that these there is sales going on and it's it's impossible for them to deny it come come interview time um, we do use covert human intelligence sources again I can't go into too much detail but 
we use the full range of tactics that are legally available to us to, to get the best evidence, and we've been very successful in that. Uh, proceeds of crime and money laundering is, is, is uh, investigations are run alongside our criminal investigations, and we have secured some, some really good results with this. Uh, we have our own financial investigator now, and again, cash seizures is becoming quite a common occurrence for, for us, and it helps to, to fund further work. So really how these tactics, what, what was resulted from these tactics, the results, well we've been going as a full-blown dedicated team since April 2015 and in that time we've uh, seized probably half a million illegal cigarettes, well over 70 kilos of hand-rolled tobacco, more than 50,000 pounds in cash seizures and as I say now that we have a cash seizure officer um, we will be able to keep the, the, the money from that. Uh, interviewed and prosecuted, well not so much prosecuted, but certainly interviewed more than 40 potential defendants. Uh, a lot of the time we will um, place conspiracy charges because we have um, defendants who are working together, maybe two or three houses at a time, working cooperatively to store and supply these cigarettes. We found that a very effective tool in, in, in tackling uh, this sort of problem. We've had many convictions, uh, including suspended prison sentences and unusually a tagging order for, for a, one particular couple. And again, as I say, several proceeds of crime actions. So I think the key to our success certainly has been employing experienced ex-police officers who've been, been able to use their skills that they've gained from serious crime investigations and transfer over. So with that, I think uh, that's me done. If there's any questions, if you'd like to contact me personally uh, for more details, then my email and contact details are there. That's great, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. We've now got a few minutes for questions uh, before we listen to Ian's presentation. So first of all, I have a question for, uh, for Doug. Um, Doug, Somebody has asked that 44 out of 89 selling illicit would indicate that this practice is right. Am I understanding this or have I missed something? Uh, well, yes, it's, it's definitely widespread, I think, in London. There are far too many shops that do sell illicit. I think those figures are maybe not uh, totally reflective because of the uh, work we did using the test purchase results and other intelligence to try and actually target the visits on the retailers we felt were most likely to supply some. So no, I don't think half of the shops in London sell illicit tobacco, thank God, but the, there is still a significant problem. Thanks Doug. Um, Chris, we have a question for you. Um, you mentioned training of officers in surveillance. Where was this training sourced? Um, we got a dedicated trainer in from us. I can't remember the trainer offhand, but if, if you want to contact me, I can certainly give you details for that. But there are several organizations who do do this sort of training. Uh, if you look online, uh, um, then it's possible. But certainly, we had one particularly tailored for our, for our purposes. So it dealt with the particular problems of local authority officers rather than police. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm, I have another question for Doug. Doug, could there be a way that the Treasury refunds local authorities for their efforts, or at a minimum pay for the time of team for the time of team used, if this is below the amount saved? Uh, well, I would hope so. Uh, is the answer. I don't know of a, a way that that can be done at the moment, but certainly in London, we are pushing for the creation of. Um, an illicit uh, tobacco and alcohol enforcement team, which hopefully would uh, give impetus as well to combining on the, the health messages and the raising public awareness and so on. And there are uh, lots of um, partners in this group that's pushing this. So we've got local authorities, the Mayor's Office, um, Public Health England, HMRC Police, and indeed our hosts, uh, Ash, are all supporting this initiative. Uh, and we're at the moment we're still in the talking stage, but hopefully somehow there will be treasury funding to do this um, sort of work because the reality is in London there's no way that we would get 
33 separate boroughs to agree anything. So I think it has to come from outside local authority. Thanks, Doug. Um, I've, I'm just going to ask Richard um, another question because, it, because I know that we only had time for one question hmm. for Richard. Uh, Richard, is there legislation that people can use to ask shisha cafes or shisha bars to display health warnings on the shisha pipe or menus? Well, the requirement is that uh, the package that the, um, the product is in must contain the specified uh, health warning. Now, there is a, a strong argument that the package is the shisha pipe itself. So uh, I know some authorities have taken the view that the, 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 uh, the pipe should come with the statutory warning. Um, as to the menus, I think that's probably um, more problematical, but certainly what they couldn't put on the menu is uh, that this product uh, is good for you, is organic, or uh, contains no harmful uh, uh, products. So I don't think they could make positive health claims on the menu, whether they would have to put the, uh, the statutory warning on I think is unlikely, but it, you know it could be argued, but certainly on the, the packet that the product is in and I would say the shisha pipe itself, you could argue very strongly that that is the packaging that the uh, uh, customer gets, so that should at least have the health warning on. If I can uh, jump in there as well. Certainly yeah. in Islington, the line we do take is that the um, water pipes should be carry health warnings if they're packed by the business's employees. Now it's difficult obviously to comply with the new legislation or even the old legislation when it comes to water pipes. So we are generally satisfied if they try and comply with the spirit of the law and have swing tags with the appropriate warnings on. Um, it's not something I'd necessarily like to take to court on its own, but that's certainly the line we take that they, there should be something. Um, thank you. Um, another question which I think definitely I, I will hand to Chris first and then Doug and then possibly Richard. Um, does anyone have any experience of liaising with Camelot about removal of license if a premises are found selling illicit tobacco? Chris. I'm certainly aware of that sanction, um, but uh, we haven't engaged with them ourselves. Okay. Uh, this could be quite short answers. <laughs> uh, and very similar answers, possibly, because that, that's my experience as well. I've heard that it has happened. I haven't done it myself. Um, most of the businesses we deal with are licensed as well, so uh, we find the license review procedure a very strong sanction and tend to go down that line. Okay. I, I would echo that myself. Um, license reviews, we use tobacco sales as well for that. We use that okay. as part of the evidence. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I, yep. I, this Richard, I would just add to that as well that uh, a premise that has an alcohol license are under serious risk if they are breaching tobacco control legislation. And I know uh, within the North East it has been used for, for quite a lot of uh, premises. Even if it just ends up with a suspension of the license, the alcohol license based on tobacco related offences, it, it's an extremely powerful tool. OK. Thanks, Richard. Um, I think we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Um, it, this one is a, a question for Doug, and somebody's asking a bit more information on the illicit tobacco roadshows in London. They say that they sound really interesting, and um, you know, to get a sense of what they look like and who they're for, are they for the public or stakeholders. So I don't know if you're able to give a bit more information on your thinking so far. Well, well, it's very, very early stages, and in fact, we had a presentation ourselves at a meeting last week. So um, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, the, the road shows will be based on the uh, BWY K9 stand that they have, which is, is public facing, but also, you know, if for best use, you would get your stakeholders along as well. The presence of the dogs helps um, get the public in, get the public interested. And I think, you know, the, the best way to do it would be to have relevant other partners, such as maybe the fire service talking about the reduced ignition propensity and giving away smoke alarms. 
and a stop smoking service and so on in the same area at the same time. Um, one of the benefits that we like is that it, it's in other places that have done it before, it's been very immediate. So you tend to get quite a lot of, lots of intelligence from the public who come and engage with you. And because you have dogs there and officers there, that can be sometimes can be actioned immediately. So it will help with the publicity as well if you can say, you know, this amount was seized after um, after the road show. Thank you. Um, we've got time for one more question before Ian's presentation, um, and I uh, I will I'll ask Doug to see if he knows the answer to this, and if not, then I'll pass it to Chris and Richard. Um, a question from someone that they've said, we've noticed that more shop staff seem to be keeping the tobacco on their person. Do we have the powers to search them? Um, I don't think so, but there's sometimes ways and means. Uh, I, I've often been in shops where we think someone's got it, and so initially we just ask, you know, can we see your coat or something? Um, I've also come across um, occasions, or one occasion I remember in particular, where an HMRC officer was with just noticed that a jacket was hanging strangely, so he patted it down and um, found lots of tobacco in the sleeves of the jacket. So I don't, you don't have powers obviously to to search someone. Um, only the police would have powers to do that. But I think uh, keep your eyes open, ask a question. Um, push the boundaries would be my advice. Okay, anything else to add on that, I suppose, from Chris and uh, Richard with your experience? Uh, just just from my point of view, this is Chris, um, we, we often find uh, cigarettes uh, hidden in jackets. More often than not, fortunately, they're hanging on the back of the door or, or on a chair, and so you know, there's not an issue of searching a person. But I think if we did have that issue, we'd probably ask the police whether they would have powers of search in that instance. Um, but yes, I mean, one of the other issues, obviously, if they're not wearing the jacket, is who owns it. We've had a couple of cases where we've had real problems where they've said it's a member of staff's jacket and being able to prove who, is, who it actually belonged to was an issue. But it, it's just a question of dealing with it the best you can. Thank you. Um, we will, uh, if, if no one has anything to add on that, then we're just going to um, hand over to you. And we do have some other questions. So what I would say at this point is if um, your question hasn't been answered, we will be um, putting together a Q&A document and we'll be circulating this uh, after the webinar. Um, but next up we have Ian. Ian Wilmore is a specialist policy advisor at ASH. And Ian's going to be giving an overview of ASH's recent report, Counter Arguments, which was published in October 2016 and, um, and he's also going to talk about the next steps in relation to licensing. Ian. Okay, can everybody hear me? Am I live? Yep, good, okay. And can everybody see my screen? Great. Okay, so um, Counter Arguments was uh, a piece of research uh, which we published in October last year. Um, having for some time wanted to uh, collect more information on what um, small retailers in particular uh, are doing and how their business works in relation to tobacco. Um, obviously, you all know that the uh, small retailer through outfits like the Tobacco Retailers Alliance and the Alliance, uh, Association of Convenience Stores and others are very much engaged in lobbying against most tobacco control legislation, uh, including standardized packaging, display bans, and so on. So understanding what their businesses are uh, struck us as being important. Um, so the key findings from this were first um, that there's a high volume of tobacco sales in convenience stores, but actually small retailers make lower profit margins from tobacco compared to virtually everything else. So the margin on tobacco products came out at around 6% compared to something more like a quarter on other products. Um, one result of that being that tobacco constitutes 
less than 10% of average weekly profits. So it's not trivial, but it's less um, uh, dramatically dominating their business than sometimes the lobbyists like to pretend. Um, TMA, the Tobacco Manufacturers Association, tend to say that tobacco is a, a driver for bringing people into the uh, stores because makers buy other products while they're there. Um, I mean, the answer to that would be that virtually everything that small retailers sell is, in a sense, a driver. If I pop in for a pint of milk in the small retailer, it's quite likely that I'll buy something else at the same time. Um, the majority, something like four and five of small retailer transactions don't involve tobacco products. Um, retailers are generally encouraged by the tobacco industry, which maintains very close relations with uh, retailers it supplies, um, to stock the widest variety of brands possible. Um, in fact, it might well be in their commercial interest to stock fewer brands, and um, those retailers who are friendly to tobacco control, which is not very many, but uh, a significant and helpful group, um, tend to say that they think that would that would be in the interest of uh, quite a few retailers more than currently do this. Okay, so. Um, the next question in counter arguments was about illicit trade. Uh, obviously, the industry likes to um, claim that there's a direct linear relationship between tobacco taxation and uh, the market share of illicit cigarettes. That is, in fact, not the case. So while tobacco taxation has risen, the market share of illicit cigarettes in the UK has fallen. Uh, by something like a half since uh, 2000, and by for hand rolled tobacco around a third. Um, this is because uh, HMRC and the UK government, Border Force, and other players like Trading Standards have implemented since 2000 a pretty uh, effective coordinated policy to act on uh, illicit trade. And in fact, if you look at the illicit trade globally. Um, generally speaking, the biggest driver of illicit trade is the uh, resources available to law enforcement and possibly the degree of um, uh, corruption uh, in particular countries. And in fact, it's uh, usually poorer countries with relatively low tobacco taxation who have very high levels of illicit trade. So the um, common sense argument about the relationship between tax and illicit is just, uh, is just wrong. Um, since 2013-14, which is the figure I've given in this, uh, there's been a slight uptick in um, the level of illicit trade in the UK, according to HLTS, uh, according to HMRC estimates. But um, they give such wide error bars that that's probably within the margin of error. Uh, okay, so this next slide is just um, uh, summarising the. Uh, the previous one, so uh, generally low profit margins, um, uh, fewer brands would mean more space to promote other things. Uh, you should look at footfall as not just a relation to tobacco, but in relation to all products, uh, and illicit trade is uh, at least, relatively speaking, under, under control. Um, okay, so the next slide is the slide of death that everybody who works in local government is probably painfully familiar with, which is essentially um, the, the graph of future funding against uh, expenditure. And you can see, uh, as, as I say, everyone in local government will understand, a widening gap between uh, current activity and available funds as we move forward to 2019-20. And this is already uh, being um, resulting in significant cuts in local authority services, including training standards departments and um, other enforcement areas in local government. So there's a clear funding problem, which if we don't address in some way is going to mean less enforcement activity by local authorities uh, across across the country. Okay. Um, now, at the moment, we have a negative licensing system is euphemistically called in England, which means that um, uh, retailers appear on a, 
a, a, a list of uh, shops that sold tobacco and theoretically uh, can be removed from that list in the event that they break the law. Uh, but the last time I found any figures was for 2012-13. There may be more up-to-date ones, and as you can see, it's uh, virtually not used. Um, I listened to the a previous speaker saying that um, local authorities have uh, used uh, alcohol licensing to uh, enforce against tobacco-related offences, and uh, I, I'm aware that that's the case. Um, Opinions on that seem to differ a bit when, when I talk to uh, people in local authorities who deal in this area. Uh, some of them say that their legal departments are quite um, timid about using that route. Um, it would seem to me that um, you know it's more satisfactory if you have a system where you can enforce directly against tobacco-related offences without having to uh, borrow a parallel jurisdiction, as it were. Um, just uh, briefly, there's a registration system in Scotland, um, and I think something similar coming into effect in Wales, but um, again, that's essentially a negative licensing arrangement. Um, so what we're looking for is uh, a positive licensing scheme um, with annual renewal, um, and it should be required uh, to, that you have a license before you sell, supply, store, transport uh, tobacco products. So um, if you don't have a license, it then becomes a criminal offence to do any of that. So I suppose the analogy is with something like a driving license. Um, we would want to apply a licensing system throughout the supply chain. So that would include producers, wholesalers, and retailers. I think that would um, that would be extremely helpful in relation to enforcing against illicit trade because um, in the future, well, to some extent in the past, but even more in the future because of the tracking and tracing regime under the Tobacco Products Directive and because of the illicit trade protocol, uh, investigations will want to move up the illicit supply chain from the from the point of sale up as high up the supply chain as you can go. Uh, so if your whole um, uh, if the whole thing is subject to licensing, that gives you some leverage over the whole supply chain, which could be very useful. Um, licenses should obviously be withdrawn or suspended if the license holder gets, breaks the law, um, if they break license conditions, uh, or if the local authority gets strong non-conviction information, showing a good case for having the license withdrawn. It's debatable about what that would be, but. Um, Essentially, it, it has to do with whether uh, the license holder is, is uh, of, as it were, good character. Um, okay, so uh, conditions for retailers, well, they would include um, not meeting the um, display and point of sale bans, selling illicit tobacco, selling to minors selling single sticks and failing to keep supply chain records. And of course, when standardized packaging is fully implemented, uh, anything in relation to that. Um, it's still possible, and in fact, I've done this myself, to walk into small retailers in uh, parts of the country, so in my case, in Tottenham in North London, and actually see them fairly openly selling to miners. So uh, I don't think that has gone away. Um, and certainly when my local authority does its test purchasing stuff, uh, it's still catching a significant number of retailers uh, doing sale to miners. Um, local authorities need the powers and the means to investigate and enforce quickly and effectively. That means that I think income from licensing has to go to the local authority and the license fee has to be set at a reasonable level. Um, I also heard a previous speaker talked about cash seizures being used to uh, fund further work, which just makes complete sense. Um, licensing ought to provide a useful income stream for that purpose. Uh, there's a continuing issue, which I, I'm sure everybody is aware of, about how far information is shared between um, national agencies, local authorities, regional partnerships, and other players. Uh, to allow for effective enforcement throughout the supply chain. I've um, met quite a few customs officers in the course of doing work on illicit trade, and um, they are extremely reluctant often to share information about current investigations 
um, partly for good reasons, but um, you know it's clear that HMRC's record of working with local authorities and regional partnerships is not as robust as it could be. Um, yeah, so uh, just to go back to the funding, um, we've been arguing for some time that there ought to be a tobacco levy on sales or profits. Um, the government did consult on that and subsequently gave up. But now uh, they're imposing a, a sugar tax. Um, it may be worth revisiting this because their principal argument against the levy would be, was that it would just get passed on to consumers. Well, obviously the same argument applies in relation to taxes on the sugary drinks. Um, the last two lines on that slide, what rules should there be to ensure funds are not diverse into local authority spending priorities? Uh, well, I used to be chair of finance of a local authority and um, I'm aware that uh, uh, covert or overt diversion of funds is always an issue, so that's something that would have to be considered, I think. Um, okay, so licensing should give you uh, from the point of view of uh, tobacco control generally and enforcement in particular, um, much better control of the tobacco industry, much more transparency about exactly how it works. Um, it may provide information that you can use in the future for things like possibly connecting um, approval of licensing to the planning system, possibly looking at where you've got proliferation of suppliers, things like that. Um, it should supply an income stream to local government, which uh, we all know it needs. Uh, and it should also uh, provide some more levers to tackle illicit trade and, and other enforcement issues. Um, this is a controversial slide, and I'm not sure that uh, uh, this is where it would go in the short term, but I can, con I can conceive in future uh, local authorities and um, health partnerships looking at restricting the number of retail outlets or possibly specifying excluded locations. Um, that's not necessary at the point of trying to get licensing introduced, but it's where licensing might go if it happened. Uh, so um, if we were looking at effective piece of primary legislation, it should probably allow government to specify licensing conditions under the secondary legislation to give local authorities increasing control. Um, well, obviously there's strong support for tobacco control measures from the public. Uh, we've focused on supply and demand in the past. We probably need um, better controls on the industry directly. Uh, we also need to keep inventing new um, uh, policy levers to bear down on the tobacco uh, industry uh, because if you don't then decline in prevalence will slow down or even go into reverse. Um, that's uh, a slide from New York showing how uh, their increasingly um, dynamic tobacco control policy was translated directly into significant falls in smoking prevalence. Uh, and that's it. So any questions? Yeah, thank Did you. Did I do that too fast? Or is no, that, that was the right absolutely time? perfect timing, right. Ian. Um, we have a we have a couple of questions for you based on um, counter arguments. Um, so the first question is: How often do tobacco company reps? visit small retailers and for what purposes? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that um, from talking to our friendly retailers, there's a, a very close relationship between uh, the industry and retailers. So that, for example, um, every retailer would have been visited uh, more than once by uh, industry reps to help them deal with the uh, display ban uh, point of sale advertising restrictions and things like that. Um, there's extensive communication around things like pricing strategies, brand mix, and so on. So I think you should assume that retailers are well integrated into the uh, into the tobacco industry. Okay, and there's also a bit more information um, in the survey that we did for um, counter arguments as well. Um, so we can circulate that round when we do the Q&A document afterwards. Yeah, so um, just looking at the, the figure, which I'd forgotten, 80% um, more than 80% of retailers have spoken to a tobacco company rep at least once every six months, and nearly half see one at least once a month. 
Thanks, Ian. Um, and another question, how much capital do small retailers have tied up in tobacco stock as a proportion of all stock? Mm. Um, we didn't look at this in the research, so I don't know, but a high proportion, I think something like three quarters of the retailers that were surveyed said that they had, quote, too much money tied up in tobacco stock. Um, and I think about a quarter of them said that they had problems with the cost of stocking up. So. Uh, I think that is an issue. Um, one of the things that we might want to look further at is the uh, speed of clearance of different products in uh, in small retailers, whether tobacco stock moves faster than um, than other uh, other lines or slower. Um, that's obviously relevant to the the, the stocking up question. Thanks, Ian. Um, another question, um, you mentioned tracking and tracing, um, do you know what the latest is on that front following the European consultation last year? Yes, um, the Commission, so there, there are two relevant bits of legis or legislation or treaties here, so there's the revised tobacco products directive which prescribes a tracking and tracing regime to cover all European Union member states and there's the WHO illicit trade protocol which is gradually being ratified by countries internationally and also prescribes a tracking and tracing regime which at some point would be global. Um, the EU is going to act much faster than other parts of the world so the EU system is going to be uh, certainly the, 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 the market leader in relation to the rest of the world introducing a tracking and tracing regime. The Commission is currently um, considering and consulting on exactly what specifications should be set for uh, a TNT regime um, and I went to a big stakeholder dialogue uh, at the end of last year and we're expecting further meetings of that kind in the course of this year and the Commission to make its mind up sometime uh, towards the back end of this year. Um, the, obviously, there's a lot of contention around the tobacco industry's proprietary system, which is called Codentify, which is essentially a, um, a, a, a coding system produced by an algorithm which you can print on tobacco packaging. Uh, we don't know whether the Commission's specifications for a system will preclude the use of Codentify or whether some modified version of Codentify might be possible or what. We, we simply don't know at this stage what they will say about that. Thanks, Ian. Um, we've actually had a, another couple of questions in for um, Chris and Doug as well, so if they're happy to take um, more questions. Somebody's asked that, somebody said that on a few occasions they found money hidden, uh, sometimes more than £1,000 and sometimes less, but everyone is reluctant to seize large amounts. So should this be seized, and if so, by whom? Right, I, I suppose I could answer that one. Um, certainly, uh, you now have no powers to seize cash unless you're a financial advisor um, or you're an immigration officer, customs officer or a police officer. So a police officer can uh, seize it on your behalf if they're accompanying you, but obviously there are civil procedures uh, to, do, to do with a seizure of cash which they must follow. Um, the only other option you do have is seizing cash as evidence, which you have done on times, at times, and sometimes when the, the amount is less than a thousand pounds, um, this is one way of getting around it. But to be honest, if you if you think there may be cash seizures uh, open to you, I would get uh, cooperation from the police to see if they can process it through their systems. That's the easiest way. Thank you very much, Chris. Doug or Richard, do you have anything to add to that? I think that's uh, no, I don't think I do. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I would like to thank um, all of our speakers, Ian, Chris, Richard and Doug for their time. Um, if you want any information about any of the topics that we've been discussing today, you can find those on the CCSI website, which is www.tradingstandards.uk. Um, this webinar will be online um, later, it might be, it, it won't be uh, in the next week or two, um, but it will be up as soon as we can get it up. And we will also be circulating a Q&A document as well. So thank you very much, and I hope that you've um, enjoyed listening to it as much as I have. <laughs>